Anybody know their IQ in here? No one knows their IQ? Is that a good test? You know how Bill Gates used to hire people when he first started at Microsoft? He didn't care if you knew anything about computers. He wouldn't know what your IQ was. He figured if you're smart enough, he could teach you whatever you needed to know. It's an interesting way to look at business. He's been quite successful. Second richest man in America. Not necessarily a measure of success, but certainly a measure of wealth. But if you know anything about IQ tests, they're based on abstract reasoning for the most part. And not everybody's gifted with abstract reasoning. Because abstract reasoning isn't just something you're born with. It's not just a talent. It's something that's developed through solid geometry, through <coughs> different kinds of mathematical uh, classes that we take. And you have to, they'll show you an object and then it'll change a little in the next one and the next one. They'll say, now what comes next? And some of them you look at and it's like, we well, just go from square to square. It's obvious. And other times you look at them and it's like, I don't get it. You can look at it all day long and you just don't get it. It's one of the ways that we test for IQ. It's one of the major ways we test for IQ. So if you're not gifted in that area, haven't had training in that area, you're probably not going to do well. It's not a measure of your intelligence. It's an intelligence quotient IQ test. It's not really a measure. It's not like they put a a thing in your ear and they go, oh, you have 127 IQ. That's not how it works. It's really based on your training, your education, and some of your natural talents. So one of the first ways that we measure qualifications, at least in the world of academia, is your GPA, how you do on your SAT test. Do you still give SATs down here? But let's assume then, given that's true, that out of 50,000 people, 10,000 of them are perfectly qualified. They have four O's and they have 1,400 on their SAT tests. But there's only 5,000 seats. How do we go about deciding who gets into med school this year? Money? What does money mean? Family that has money. Eh? Family that has money. Say again? The family that has money. The family that has money. Why would money get them in? Because everyone who's going to go is going to pay. What if I took out loans so I could pay the bill? Would that be enough money? Because it doesn't come from family. It comes from a bank that's willing to back me. I'm just asking. That's OK. Because a, a wealthy family ha has more liquid assets to be able to donate to the college to get their name put on the building, which will give the influence to the board to let the job in. That, that may well be true. Some of these buildings here are named after, I'm assuming they're people. Potterburg, whatever. And the Porter campus down at Wiregrass was donated by a very, very wealthy family, gave us that land down there. How, well, how else do you get in? Eh? Sure, that's called a legacy admission. Sure, how else do you get in? Who you know. Yeah, sometimes that, that certainly can influence decisions. How else do you get in? Are there any other ways to get in? You have to be careful when you do that. It looks like your hand's going right up next to your head. I won't argue with that. I'm not sure how that comes out, but I won't argue with that. I mean, you know, people do take money for favors periodically. I know no one who does that, but I know Nasi. Nasi. What's well, a dilemma, isn't it? Because there's always more people qualified for a position than the positions that are available. I shouldn't say always, almost all the time. What's fair? Rawls last week was interested in fairness. He said, justice is fairness. What's fair? Everybody has a 4-0. Everybody has 1,400 on their SAT tests. And now we've already tilted the field in the way of money, in the way of influence, in the way of, is that really fair? Next week, we'll approach the problem by something called meritocracy. What's meritocracy mean? Two words, merit and nah. Okay. You, you, it's basically getting your position or getting what you get off of your merit, off of what you can do. Correct. 
tomorrow or next week, I mean, we'll call it moral desserts. You worked hard for it, you earned it. You should be rewarded. And that's been a standard that we use in the business field for the most part. There's a phrase out there called nepotism. If you know someone within your family, you can rise through the ranks. <clears throat> but for the most part, if you work hard, you earn it. You're the ones who get promoted. You work for Enterprise Rent-A-Car, if you have a, an MA or BA, I mean, if you have a bachelor's degree, they'll hire you. They're looking for young people. You show them that you're willing to work 14, 16 hours a day, six days a week, seven days a week. I worked for them. They're looking for hardworking people. And one out of 10 will become an office manager. And out of that one out of 10, one out of 10 office managers will become a district manager. And out of that one out of 10, one out of 10 of those people will become regional managers. And they'll move right up the food chain. And you can make really, really good money. I applied at Publix when I first came down here. And I got a phone call. A guy called me up. Michael was his name. He was a district manager. He said, can you come in for an interview? I went in for an interview. I sat down. And the only thing he wanted to know, he looked at me and he says, so you've never had a day off in 17 years? And I said, well, no. What I used to do, if I didn't work, I didn't eat. I got paid for work and I didn't get paid a salary I had to produce. He says, you have any idea how much my assistant managers make? And I said, I have no idea. He says, take a guess. I said, I don't know, 40, 50,000. He said, $60,000. He said, I want to start you in the meat department. You're going to have to work there at least six months before I can move you up. There's a lot of people at that Publix that are still working in the meat department and aren't moving up at all. Most promotions are based on merit. It's part of the system. You work hard, you get rewarded for it. You move up the food chain. That doesn't mean you're not working hard if you don't move up the food chain. But there's certain standards they use, certain merit qualifications for moving up the food chain. And when you meet those qualifications, they move you up the food chain. You've worked hard for it. Why shouldn't you earn the dessert of your merit? It's a very strong argument. If you have a 4-0 and you score 1,400 on your SATs, why shouldn't you be admitted to school? There's a school on the Hudson in New York called Bard on the Hudson. When I was playing tennis, not at the school, I couldn't get into that school, but we'd go there and play tennis with them. They had 400 students, and they all had 4-0s, and they all had 1,400 on their SATs, and I have no idea how they discriminated between all the ones that couldn't get in there. Uh, we have a biology teacher here. Her son is at Bard right now. I was blown away to find out he was at Bard. <clears throat> so it's not inconceivable that you could have 10,000 people who are fully qualified for 5,000 positions. So how does meritocracy work? If you've worked hard and you deserve the desserts of your effort, we have just too many people for too little jobs. How do you get in? Which brings us to this week's discussion, which is diversity. 80% of the population in this county is Caucasian, 5% is African American, 15% is Hispanic, 57% are women, and 43% are men. Diversity looks at this situation in says, shouldn't we reflect the community in which we live in? Well, the school does. I think 73% of the staff is female. That's not the faculty, that's the staff. And about 66% of, sta of the faculty is female. It tries to reflect this difference in this balance. Right down the line, it's called diversity. Is that a fair way to look at things? And the reason I bring it up is Dr. Sandell's lecture this day started with a girl named Cheryl Hopwood, who applied to the University of Texas Law School. And she was turned down, and her grades were acceptable. But the school had an admissions policy that was based not only on merit, but was based on diversity. They wanted to reflect the population in which they served. 40% of the population around the university was Hispanic and African American. And so they set a quota of 15% Hispanic and African American. You had to be qualified. If you were qualified, they wanted to reflect the diversity. Now, they did the same thing with female and male. They tried to reflect the nature of the community in which they lived. And Cheryl Hopwood took offense. And she said, I'm being excluded because I'm not a minority. My scores are just as good.
because I'm not a minority, I'm being excluded. And her argument was the minority had no choice in being a minority either if it's based on ethnicity. You can't help but, you can't claim any, uh, any credit for being of the lighter hue or the darker hue. It is what it is. Why should I be excluded? And the court said that the school had every right to set the admissions policy based on meritocracy. There are certain standards you have to meet, but it also had every right in its admission policy to set a standard of diversity as long as it didn't discriminate. Now, if it was a true diversity, a true reflection, then it could have been 40% African American and Hispanic, but they decided on 15%. And the Supreme Court said they don't have a problem with that. And that just rubs people the wrong way. Why does that rub people the wrong way? The standards aren't unfair. Some people are not going to be included. Only 5,000 of these people are going to make it to med school. Have the opportunity to go to med school and make a really decent living. And the other 5,000 aren't disqualified when it comes to merit. They're disqualified because they don't fit into the admission statement of the school. So another case that you're going to have to write your essay on about a fellow named Baki. I think he's a 33-year-old white man applied to the University of California, Davis, to get in med school. And he was denied access, but the situation was different. UC Davis decided that they were going to put 18 slots out of 100 aside, and they were going to fill them up with non-Caucasian people, regardless of their qualifications. And so they had some people who were admitted, accepted, whose qualifications weren't quite at the correct standard. But because they set their admissions policy up that way, Baki was not allowed in. And he took that to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, Baki was right. If your standard is based on meritocracy and diversity, that's fine. But just because you want to reflect diversity, you can't fill that up with substandard academics. It doesn't matter if it was African American, Hispanic, Asian, Hawaiian. The point of the, school, of the court was, if you have a certain standard, a meritocratic standard, if you have a certain academic standard that you're trying to meet, then for the sake of affirmative action or the sake of, of, of a quota, you can't just put anybody in there to meet the quota if you want to maintain the standard of qualifications to go to your school. And so the Supreme Court overruled and Bakke was allowed to go. And herein is the conflict that we face every day. If you leave the two-year school, admitted we're a four-year school in business and when it comes to nursing, but we're still a two-year school in many ways. And you go to the four-year college or you go to the university, you're going to run into admissions policies that may open the door to you and may end up closing the door to you. And the Supreme Court has said as long as the admission policy of a school Here's the hard part, it's fair. It's a combination of meritocracy and a combination of diversity. The school has every right to do that. It's not always been that way. During and after World War I, American Jewry, Jews, became the target of anti-Semitism by a variety of social groups, including the Ku Klux Klan and various immigration restriction advocates. Ivy League universities were no exception, and several of these venerable schools moved to restrict Jewish enrollment during the 20s. Some Jewish students at Harvard, the bellwether in American education, did not take admission restrictions lying down. Nativism, which is Americanism, which is kind of odd because the only natives in America are the, are the, are the the native Indians, the American Indians, and intolerance among segments of the white Protestant population were aimed at both Eastern European Jews and Southern European Catholics. <coughs> By the way, we didn't elect a Catholic president until 1960, and he almost didn't get elected because we were afraid the Pope would end up running America. That was the mantra that was put out there. You've never had a Jew. You finally got an African American. You have not had a female yet. 
In higher education, Jews were particularly resented. By 1919, about 80% of the students at New York's Hunter and City Colleges were Jews, and 40% at Columbia. Jews at Harvard tripled to 21% of the freshman class in 22, from about 7% in 1900. Ivy League Jews won a disproportionate share of academic prizes and election to Phi Beta Kappa, but were widely regarded as competitive, eager to excel academically, and less interested in extracurricular activities. In 1922, Harvard's president, A. Lawrence Lowell, proposed a quota on the number of Jews gaining admission to the university. Lowell was convinced that Harvard could only survive if the majority of the students came from old American stock argued that cutting the number of Jews at Harvard to a maximum of 15% would be good for the Jews because limits would prevent further anti-Semitism. Lowell reasoned, the anti-Semitic feeling among the students is increasing and it grows in proportion to the increase in the number of Jews. If their number should become 40% of the student body, the race feeling would become intense. So they put a restrictive quota on the number of Jews who could enter. And the court found that offensive as well. Now, why is this even an issue with the court? Oh, that's right. I remember that equality and justice is part of the bulwark of our tradition. It's part of our sacred documents. That somehow freedom is supposed to be maximized. And in the documents, it is. And along with freedom comes access to opportunity with no guarantee. And so if we start restricting access to opportunity by restricting the freedom to do as you choose within certain limitations, <coughs> we begin to erode, we think, the basic foundation of American justice, of American freedom. And I bring it up to you because you can't avoid this, people. We're stuck. It's still going on. You will find yourself smack dab in the middle of it, perhaps, somewhere you go next. I don't see it happening here but you could well find yourself right in the middle of it sometime. You might find it at work. You might find it in the university. I don't know where you might find it. But there's not enough, how do I say this, 4% of the jobs in America pay $100,000 a year or more. We'll do the math. That means 96% pay less. Access, and I'm not saying wealth is everything, but access to that kind of wealth is limited. All benefits are limited. And the, the conflict is between these two systems of thought, meritocracy and diversity. Most of the time, we want it to be an either or. If you're on this side, you want this side to be your benefit. This is how you want benefits distributed. If you're on this side, you want this side to be how benefits are distributed. And we've been trying for the last maybe 65, 70 years to work out a balance between the two. Understanding this, there's never going to be a balance that's completely pleasing to everyone. The greatest happiness for the greatest number, the least amount of unhappiness for the least number of people. And therein is our ethical dilemma. How do we go about resolving the difference principle that Rawls talks about? Because there will always be differences. And that will always raise the specter of fairness. By 2050, they're now estimating that 39% of us will habla español. Y por la primera vez este país probablemente hablará dos lenguas. And you won't have a choice because that's just the way it's going to flow. You had no idea what I said to you, did you? I said there's a good chance by 2050 this country will adopt two languages. Every other country in the world adopts at least two languages. One of my brother's best friends speaks five. I said, John, how'd you learn five languages? I didn't learn them. I grew up in an area where everybody spoke Latin, Italian, French, Greek, and Romanian. He says, I learned them just because those were all my friends. We all learned it together. That ought to upset a lot of people. Traditions, what we hold on to. So it brings up an ethical issue. The tide rises and the tide falls. The tide comes in and the tide goes out. 
composition of this country is not what it was 255 years ago. And it's not static. It's not going to stay that way. The principles stay the same. They're enshrined in sacred documents. But the application of them rises and falls, comes and goes. And they can only be resolved, I think Dr. Sandel is absolutely right about this, through dialogue. Sometimes you will end up on the short end of the stick, like it or not. When I got in the military, I went to work in a Hispanic community, went for an interview. I don't know what possessed me before the, before the interview. I had a pad of paper, and I'm sitting out there waiting for the guy to be done. Did I ever talk about this? Waiting for the guy to be done with the person in front of me. And I just felt a, I drew a tombstone, and I wrote my epitaph on it. And then I closed it up. The guy came out from his interview, and I was introduced in. Hi, how you doing? We talked, and the guy sat down with me. He says, before we start, I'm curious. What do you want for an epitaph on your tombstone? I'm so glad you asked. So I just opened my book up and showed it to him, and the look on his face was just, I wish, I wish we had cell phones with little cameras then, you know? And from that point on, I knew I didn't have that job. And when we were all done, I said to him, I said, so do I have the job? And he said, no. And I said, why not? And he said, because you intimidate me. He says, I'm worried you'll take my job. And I said, well, I have a plan for that. I said, you tell him you discovered me, and I'll push you up the ladder ahead of me, and when you fall off, I'll just take your place. Well, I was just being smart with him. And I had to go find a job someplace else. I became a night clerk in a motel. Oh, well, it's all that was available. What are your thoughts? Meritocracy, diversity, combination of the two? Maybe a third option that we haven't talked about? Well, that's kind of a rhetorical question, but sooner or later you are going to answer that question. We started out with hard quotas, hard hiring practices. Look, ladies, you're in the workforce now because you push the issue. Before World War II, you were not in the workforce. It was only because of the Great Depression that you were invited into the workforce. And then when World War II started and 16 million men or so put on uniform and went overseas, we had bothered to train you in the welfare system, so you went in the factories and built the bombers and the tanks and the machine guns for us. And when the war was over, you came home and said, uh, am I really supposed to go back on the farm and just have babies? No. I've come too far to go back on the farm if I don't want to, and so suddenly you're in the workforce. We never had to deal with females in the workforce, never had to deal with sexual discrimination or sexual harassment practices. Life changes. Any questions about what we're trying to develop here and why it's important ethically for you? Okay. I'm going to go over the notes for you so you do well on your exam. <clears throat> Cheryl Hopwood is one of the cases. Again, you're going to have the Bakke case. This explains a little bit about Bakke in 74. The question is right here. Can Bakke be said to deserve to be admitted to medical school? Sure, he didn't choose to be a member of the white majority. He was just born that way, but he also didn't choose to be naturally gifted. He was also born that way. These are factors equally outside his control. Why should Bakke's application to med school be considered solely on the basis of personal and academic merit when this depends at least partly on factors over which he had no control? It's one of the arguments that people use for diversity and against meritocracy. A lot of the giftings you have are beyond your control. Your academic ability, your social ability, your ethnicity, your gender, they're beyond your control. So why should you be rewarded for those? Maybe you should. Maybe you shouldn't. As a result of the Hopwood case, there are three foundational reasons for affirmative action or for diversity. One is correcting for testing. Not all tests are equal, and not all places where people go to school are equal either. How many do I have from New York, from the state? Anybody? Just you? You, you have a Regents diploma? No? Regents diploma? No? Regents diploma? Back when I was in school, you could not get out of eighth grade if you couldn't read at the college level. 
and you had to pass a regents exam at the end of your high school. And if you didn't, you didn't graduate high school. You didn't get this precious diploma. This diploma was so valuable. And we were on a 100-point system, not a 4.0 system. When you graduated high school, they automatically added six points to your GPA so you could be competitive with the rest of the country because it was so much easier for the rest of the country to get out of high school automatically. When you showed up at college and you said, I have a Regents Diploma, they said, interesting, someone who is academically prepared for higher education. And I don't mean to say you're not prepared for higher education, but it carried a certain weight with it. It's like they're graduating from an Ivy League school, you know, it kind of opens people's eyes or it used to. Okay. So the training we got, we had track systems. They had track one, two, three. If you were kind of average in school, you were track two. If you were accelerated, you were in track one. If you needed some remedial work, you were track three. And you didn't stay in one, two, or three. It depended on the subject. I was in track one for everything but science. I was always in track three. I hated science. It wasn't until I was in the military out in the field in Germany, and I cannot tell you where I found this book. It was The Philosophy of Einstein's Theory of Relativity. And I devoured it out in the fields. First time I got interested in science, my major looked at me and goes, what the? blank are you reading, Pollard? And I told him, he says, you understand it? And I said, the math is way beyond my pay grade, but yeah, the rest of it I understand. If I was your age now, I'd be in astrophysics or microbiology. I just, I'm in love with science, string theory, M theory. But I went through high school in track three. Everything else was track one. I was done with calculus before I got out of high school. And so that kind of diploma then said something. That kind, it was a meritorious kind of thing. You worked hard. They knew you were super educated. They wanted you to go to school. I barely got into college. I was too busy playing. I'm too much in athletics. In fact, I went to college on an athletic scholarship. I went and played tennis. So all testing is not equal. Like right now, you guys have what, the FCAT down here in Florida? Up in Michigan, they call it the MEEPS test. The federal government set a standard, and then they left it up to the states to implement it. So one state does this, and one state does that, and another state does that. And you think all the scores should be the same, but they're not. We still have a lexical ranking, and some states are way at the bottom, and some are way at the top, because these tests aren't all equal. So if we use just test scores to evaluate someone's entrance into college, the question becomes, well, how fair is that? How good a judgment is that of somebody's ability? When you come from rural areas that are maybe using a text that's 20 years old because they can't get the newest edition, are you really getting the same quality of education that you get from a school that maybe has tons of money and can keep up with all the text, maybe the best teachers, et cetera? So we realize this is an issue. So one of the things is to try and correct for testing. Another one is compensating for past wrongs. This has been a rub in the community for a long time. How long does a generation that didn't cause a problem have to pay for it? When I was in Europe, World War II had ended in 46, maybe 47, 46, 47. And I met a lot of young Germans, and they were just ticked that they were still being blamed for what the Nazis did. They had nothing to do with it. Now, their families did, but they saw the error. They weren't there. They didn't give their consent to it. And yet a lot of young Germans a lot of years after the war, paid a social price for that. They were made to feel like it was their fault and they had to somehow compensate for the injustices. Same thing happens here in slavery and there were injustices and compensations had to be made. The Native Americans have gone through their compensations and how we've reconciled with them. We gave them their own land. What's their own land, by the way? Hey. Eh? Well, that's what we gave them, but that, yeah, but I'm thinking of something else. Hard Rock Cafes. Yeah, the cafe. Any, any piece of land that the, that the Native American owns is their nation. Our laws no longer apply. You can carve it right out of the center of wherever it is, and that's their nation. They have, we have up in Petoskey, we have a cafe, uh, not a cafe, we have a casino up there, and they have their own place up there. They're fully legitimate. They're sovereign nation. Wherever they have land, that's their sovereign nation. And... For a lot of them, not all of them, but for a lot of them, they've taken that as a mechanism for their economic growth. And that's how they repay themselves. They get scholarships, they get stipends every month, and for them, that's a system they've chosen. They're, they're fine with it. I don't know how it is down here in Florida. I think you can't have a casino in Florida, can you? It's got to be off land, or is it not? No, the Seminole Indians, the Seminole Indian tribe owns the Hard Rock Casino over in Tampa. 
Okay. They, they own all the casinos. They're the, they're the wealthiest uh, Indian tribe in the nation right now. So they can't have territory on, on the U.S. Too. Okay, I wasn't aware of that. Okay. So another way that we try and balance or make things more level is dealing with compensating for past wrongs. The third one that's really on the center stage these days is diversity. Trying to make the community reflective or the school reflective of the community in which they live. It's just another attempt to try and bring everybody into the fold. To try and reduce the differences between how the benefits and the burdens are distributed. No one, we're never going to get it completely fair, completely equal. There's a practical question for that. Questions the effectiveness of affirmative action policies. It argues that the use of racial preferences will not bring about a more pluralistic society or reduce prejudice or inequalities, but will damage the self-esteem, perhaps, of minority students, increase racial consciousness on all sides, heighten tensions, and promote resentments among white ethnic groups who feel they too should get a break. There's a principled objection. However, the court has said once the university defines its mission and sets its admission standards, everyone has a legitimate expectation to admission insofar as they meet those standards better than other applicants. So if you meet the standards, you qualify for admission. That does not mean you'll get admitted. What if there's too many applicants who are qualified? My youngest one, Corey Michael, he was accepted into Michigan State, and we missed his orientation time. And normally, they'd let you go again. They have four or five orientations. I called him up, and I said, listen, it's my fault. I got your letter, and I didn't understand it. Can we come for the second one? They said, no, the problem is we build into our uh, orientation time a rejection rate of 13%. In other words, they accept, say, 10,000 students. And 13% of them say, thanks, but I'm going to Purdue or I'm going to go to this school or that. He says, right now it's at 7%. We have no room for your son. It wasn't that Corey didn't qualify. They sent him an acceptance and sent him an orientation. It's such a big school, 40,000 people. They have four or five orientations. Missed the first one, and they said, I'm sorry, we don't have room. He qualified. No room. That was a pain. He ended up going to a local two-year college, got what he needed. And then he was accepted back at MSU. They didn't disqualify him. They just said, we don't have room. You missed your appointment. Reapply next year. Unless standards radically change, we'll accept you again. You've already been accepted once. Make sure you hit your orientation this time. And then he went to Michigan State for three years, and he graduated with his degree. So the landscape that you're dealing with, whether you come down on the side of diversity or meritocracy or a combination of them, the court has said, and the court determines how we understand the freedoms and the exercise of those freedoms in all arenas of life, whether it's the workplace, the, uh, the, the academy, or where, is that schools are not absolutely free to set admission standards. They can go off the wall like Harvard did. Harvard changed that law about Jews, and most of the schools had to do that, and they had to change the same ones about Catholics. Okay, Catholics have not had an easy time in this country in the beginning. We were mostly a Protestant country for the most part that came over from England. The school said as long as your admission standard is fair, that it's based on a principle of fairness. So how do we define fairness? There's the wiggle room. But as long as it's based on fairness, those people that meet those standards are qualified to be accepted, but not everybody gets accepted. There's too many people. We have to make decisions. The greatest happiness for the greatest number, the least amount of unhappiness for the least number of people. You're going to find this in the workplace people. If you go on to another extended time of education, you're going to find it at the college. You're going to find it at the university. It doesn't go away. The court has said that institutions are allowed to set hiring practices, whether it's admission policies in college or whether it's affirmative action programs in the workplace. As long as it's fair, as long as the court deems it is fair, either reflective of the diversity of the community or reflective of proper academic qualifications, they're free to do what they want to do. Unless they absolutely violate subgroups' rights or they purposely exclude a group of people, they're free to do it. And you're in a competitive market. That's capitalism. Even here, it's capitalism. 
I mean, how well you do here will determine probably how much wealth you'll make out there. It'll have be an indicator how well you do. Because at the next level, you will compete with some brainiacs. When you go to the four-year school and then you get into graduate school, there are some brainiacs out there. They're entitled to be there just like you and I are entitled to be there. So any questions about this? This is just the final development of Rawls. Now, next week we're going to do Aristotle, and he was going to promote meritocracy. Shouldn't the best flutist get the best flute? Shouldn't the best violinist get a Stradivarius? There's a reason in the orchestra we have first violin, second violin, and third violin, and third violin knows not to sit in first violin's chair. And Aristotle says, if you had the gift, do you not have a responsibility to perfect it? And if you do, should you not be rewarded for it? That's why LeBron James gets $30 million a year. Today, he's probably the best athlete we've ever produced. Whether he's better than Michael or not, that's questionable. But we reward him for his effort. Now, one of the problems with that is somebody out there is probably just as effort-minded did I mention Stanley Springle in this class? Stanley, Stanley Pringle? Stanley went to school here. When he was here, he had, he had dreadnoughts, and he played number one on the basketball. I've never seen a guy go down the court that fast. And I played sports. I went to school on scholarship. First time I went to a game, he, he ran by everybody. I thought, how did you do that? And Stanley graduated here two years, and then I was up north for a summer, and we're watching him. It happens to be University of Pittsburgh playing, I don't remember who. And there's this guy who's a point guard, and I'm looking at him thinking, I think I know that guy. I don't know anyone who goes to the University of Pittsburgh. And I remember looking at my friend saying, I hope they foul him. They'll put him on the foul line. Maybe they'll put his name up. Stanley Pringle, he cut his dreadnoughts off. He went to University of Pittsburgh, and immediately they gave him the number one position on the team, point guard. They call him number one guard. And he went and tried out for the pros. There's 440 pro basketball position players. Most of them don't play. They're just on the practice squad. Stanley's playing in Turkey now, making about 75, 80,000 a year playing for the Turkey national team. He was that good to make a national team. Anybody know anyone who's national on a team? But he couldn't make the pros as good as he was. He had a choice to either not do sports anymore, pack up, go to Turkey and play the game he loves. He went to Turkey and he plays the game he loves. That's the world we live in. Merit is rewarded. Those with the best merit are rewarded the best. And those without it have to make adjustments. We all have to make adjustments. Everybody's going to have to make adjustments. Questions for me, people? Okay, I can't, yes. Not a question, but a comment. I mean, that's one of the things that's, when, when I started coming here was, it was told to me to make sure you get involved with other things extracurricular because they come, when you go to a four year college, sometimes it comes down to those things like PTK. Absolutely you know, does. Honor Society, you know, that would be the deciding factor to get you in. Yeah. Everybody hear what Perry said? They will look then at other factors to see how well you're qualified. Leadership, that's why a lot of people who come out of the military, especially if you're in the officer corps, you have leadership ability. They will look at that and they will weigh that in a certain proportion and give you the benefit of things. Okay, would you do that for me then? Okay, just fill it out as soon as you're done. Everybody's free to leave. Just give them back to uh, Monty, please.